we couldn't communicate with the orphanage. Everybody, all foreign citizens were sent back home to their own countries. A Spanish journalist got killed and I decided to fly to Haiti because I, I, I was going to get my daughter no matter what. That's Jamie Bertrand and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Cara Duffy. And in this episode, I am so excited for you to meet Jimmy. She is incredible. The stories she shares in this episode are incredible. Honestly, you'll be hanging on to your seat and her business is changing the world in major ways. Like you cannot get more powerful lady. Her company, Nurse the Brain Institute, teaches clients how to change behaviors to nurse their brains for optimal health, wellness, and longevity. Best of all, she's working with individuals and communities who upon learning these skills for themselves can be empowered to not only live their best lives, but to make impacts throughout their own communities and the world. I cannot wait to hear your feedback. Before I jump into this episode, I wanna speak to all of you who are Googling how to make a career change, how to start my own business, or how to avoid going back to my old job. I am here for you. That is literally why I have built my business, my Thrive membership, and all the other courses and programs that are available to you. I really mean it when I say I'm here to help you achieve your dream life. Visit caraduffy.com to book a free call today or skip directly to learn.caraduffy.com to check out the Thrive membership and the other programs that are available to you right now. Let's create a custom plan that will actually work for unique you and your unique dream life. Well, hello. Welcome to the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you. You have a very interesting job. You do very cool things. Um, but let's begin. Please tell everybody who you are and you know where you are in the world and what you do. Um, thank you, Cara. Uh, my name is Jamie Bertrand. I am the CEO at Nourish the Brain Institute. And what I do is... I help people and the students to live their best life by nourishing their brain through food and superfood and the science of the mind. Very cool. Um, there's so many questions I have to dig into that. I did go to your website and take the quiz, so I know what my, my uh, what I came back as. We can talk about that a bit. Um, but how did you get into this world of helping people through food and their brain? Well, uh, everything started in 2006 when I was a single mother of two working full time and studying. I was finishing my PhD in international conflict management. And all of a sudden, uh, my dad got sick with cancer and I thought I could run his business too. Uh, he owned a construction company back in Barcelona. And my brain had another idea. My brain, all of a sudden, one day I woke up in the morning and I couldn't move. So my, I knew I wasn't dead because I had thoughts, mm -hmm. but my body wasn't moving. So all of a sudden I had Crazy. to connect, to make the connection from my brain to my central nervous system, to move my feet, to get up, to be able to go to the phone and call for help. Mm -hmm. So it was a very scary moment. Uh, but then I, when I was rushed to the ER, I had all kinds of tests. Um, everything was, I mean, I was cleared by the doctors and I had to figure out a way to put my brain back together because a set of, sim of symptoms um, came up, uh, such as mild depression. Um, I lost my period for a year and a half. I couldn't go outside during the day because I had really high photosensitivity, lots of uh, stress and anxiety. And I had to figure out what happened to me. So I thought, if I broke my brain, I can put it back together. So I started studying the brain and what the behaviors were, the patterns that I was following. And, and that's what I did. It took me a year and a half, but I put it back together. I love that. It speaks so much about what type of person you are to say, if I broke my brain, I can fix it. I don't know if that would be everyone's normal reaction, <laughs> you know, who were you before this happened where that was just the first thought that came to your mind? Well, everything, I mean, I had a really easy childhood. I was very sheltered in my home. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I came from a really loving and, and caring uh, household. Uh, but when I grew up, I put myself always into these kind of challenging situations. I got into a relationship and I got married when I was young and I was studying and I had uh, 25, I had my uh, son. And it was really, I mean, it was a very abusive marriage. So uh, there is where I started to have lots of stress and mm -hmm. suppressing all kinds. I mean, like only, not only emotions, also communication. I wasn't mm -hmm. telling anybody that I was struggling because mm -hmm. I was always worried about, you know, like worrying my parents or worry, you know, like it was mm -hmm. just, um, I learned how to suppress a lot in my early ages. Yes. Yeah. But, um, and, and you just kept moving forward, right? Cause you sound like someone who just gets things done, handles things and keeps going. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it was, you know, like I learned how to push through. Yeah. Right. Like, my career, uh, studying and working and mm -hmm. uh, family. And, you know, like, uh, I mean, even when I got divorced, right? Like I made his life really easy in order to get what I wanted, which was sole control of my child, which was three years and a half at that time. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, like it was, yes, I've been, I learned how to push through a lot. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it, it's one thing to go through that experience yourself, which sounds terrifying and to realize like, okay, like I'm not dying there. I can figure a way out of this. It's another to say, I've now done that. I want to share it with other people. At what moment did you realize that you maybe didn't know if you had a business or not, but you knew you had to share this? Yes. Uh, so that happened when I actually, when I moved here to the United States, I mean, mm -hmm. I moved here in 2012 mm -hmm. and, and I, I worked in a behavioral and mental health facility as a business director because mm -hmm. my background was in business. And, and um, I, I saw how mental health and behavioral health is being addressed here, right? Like mm -hmm. we are um, taking care of the symptoms, but not the root of the problem, right? Like we allow people to keep eating chemicals and add mm -hmm. hormones outside hormones and mistreat and neglect uh the healthiest habits like mm -hmm. sleeping exercising people is overweight type 2 diabetes i mean all these things that are symptoms mm -hmm. but we don't address the root of the problem and i thought i think we can do a little bit better than that so that's <laughs> why hopefully we can do a little bit hopefully we can do a lot right <laughs> yes Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in the beginning, I created the, um, my company, Nourish the Brain Institute, just to uh, work one on one with clients. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I created a group, uh, which is basically classes to teach yeah. a little bit extra material. And later on, uh, I created a program to certify people to do what I do. Mm hmm having access to change people's physiology to change their emotions is so powerful for what you do. Mm -hmm. What are some of the results? Like how, how do people react when they're going to these programs with you? Well, there's all kinds of, I mean, because everybody comes for a different reason, like interesting enough uh, in the beginning, when I started working, um, when I created my business, uh, the cases uh, were much simpler, like basically addressing eating habits, like to mm -hmm. lose weight or, you know, like to do a little bit better. Um, as, as, as I evolved and I grew in the business, uh, everything got more, I mean, all the cases have been a little bit more uh, complicated with emotional mm -hmm. issues, right? Like from mental health, depression, uh, mm -hmm. Then I became a member of the council, the council for suicide prevention, mm -hmm. and I work with the VA, with the Veteran Center. I work with the Veteran Outreach Program, and the most recent thing is I am training the medics for the special forces. How cool is that? Yeah, I mean, and, and to to be able to train people who are going to impact the world in such a big way. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, when you got that opportunity you know how did that feel for you well to me this is the most satisfying part of my job and i'm super excited about the next what's coming 
uh, for Nourish the Brain Institute, but, you know, like just being able, able to hang out with those guys, which are the 1% of the military in the United States and probably of the world, right? Like these people are smart, strong, they are amazing human beings. And I always, I always wanted to give back to them. And the reason is because I, they, if it wasn't for them today, I would not have uh, my daughter. Ooh, what happened? <laughs> there is a big story behind that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything you want to share for everyone? Oh listening? yeah. Totally. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So in 2004, um, well, not in 2004, into like earlier, I don't even mm-hmm. remember when it was, I started uh, the process of adoption. Uh, mm-hmm. for a daughter. I was a single mother with, uh, with my son, with my biological son. And I want, I always wanted a daughter. I didn't have a partner. I didn't have plans to have a partner in the near future. And I felt like it was uh, important to me to have, uh, to have a daughter. And I thought I'm going to do the process myself. And mm-hmm. that's what I did. At that point, um, it was a little bit difficult to adopt in in different countries mm-hmm. uh, by yourself as a single woman. This is years ago, right? Many countries uh, they want uh, children, uh, families that are married for a certain amount of years. You have to be married, or you have to be Catholic, or you know, mm-hmm. like things like this. It was tricky. Or some places simply they make you wait many many years, like. Uh, yeah. At that time, I think it was Brazil. They ask you to wait for 10 years. And, it, you know, like it's it crazy. seemed like, mm-hmm. yes, an insane amount of time. And so I decided to do it myself. And the country that put made it easier was uh, Haiti. And when I was, you know, like every, the process was uh, going on, uh, at some point they send you a picture of your daughter and that's your daughter. I mean, like, there is no, you know, like, that's her, period. Mm-hmm. And she was uh, five years and a half at that point. So she was kind of growing up child. And all of a sudden, when everything was about to be done in 2004, Haiti got into a coup d'etat. Mm-hmm. And in March, I remember uh, March was a point where uh, we knew we couldn't communicate with the orphanage. Uh, everybody, all foreign citizens were sent back home to their own countries. A Spanish journalist got killed. Mm-hmm. And I decided to fly to Haiti because I, I, I was going to get my daughter no matter what. I didn't have any paperwork done. And I was told that the paperwork was in government offices. And the offices were, were burned down. So there was no paperwork. So my lawyer in Haiti said, don't worry about it. You just have to start the process again and they will give you another daughter. And I thought, oh my gosh. No, you already, you already know who she is. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like it's like you have a child and all of a sudden they say, no, you know what? Not this one, another one. I mean, doesn't make any sense. So I went there and well, I bought a... Um, a ticket to go to Dominican Republic. And the night before I was flying, I got a, a telegram from my from a Spanish government saying that, uh, from um, um, foreign affairs, saying that I had forbidden to fly to Haiti. And if I still was going to go, my family was responsible to repatriate the corpse in the case that I was killed there. Wow. So I had no support. <laughs> also, they, they let me know that the the embassy and the consulate was closed. So there was no consul. So I, I had no support on the field, right? So what I did, it was go to the Dominican Republic. And I thought I will figure out a way to fly because there was no flights to Haiti. And... And what I did is, you know, like I start asking people if they were going somehow to Haiti, right? Like, oh, private jet or, you know, like, I, I don't know. I thought the last resource is renting a car, even though I know that was crazy and very risky, but we thought I got to go there. So I saw this guy wearing a military uh, uniform and American military uniform. And I asked him, I said, um, are you going to Haiti? And he said, yes. And I said, can I go with you? And he said, no, ma'am. This is, <laughs> this is not a, civ- a civilian plane. It's a military plane. So no, you can't. 
and I, and I asked to talk to the superior and the superior said, we'll take you there, but you've never been here. So I never knew the guys. I never knew any name. So I know nothing about them, but I always thought if I have the chance, I will always give them back. And that's what I did. And, and I love working with them. Yeah. And so you got on that airplane, you got into Haiti, and then you got your daughter and you got to bring her home. Well, that was being in Haiti was another adventure because, of course, yeah. I didn't have paperwork. Mm-hmm. And the orphanage didn't want to give me a, a, a little kid. That's kidnapping, right? <laughs> right. So no, no passport, no nothing. So I, I mean, like there was no way, you know, like all the odds were against yeah. me. Right. But I had that intuition that was guiding me so strong. And, and I had, you know, like that certainty that happens very few times in life that everything is going to work yeah. out for me. Right. Yeah. So, um, I went to the orphanage like three or four times with my lawyer. They didn't want to give me the girl. So I thought, I'm just going to wait outside. And I mm-hmm. told them, I said, if I get killed, is you know, my government is going to go against you. I mean, yeah. it's up to you. So I waited outside and they had me there like for a few hours, I don't know, four or five hours. And and then they said, just take the girl, do whatever <laughs> you want. <them. laughs> you figure out a, go to, a, a way to go. And I went to the consulate and there was nobody there for a Haitian uh, receptionist that was playing cards. And I said, I'm going to wait here for the consul. And she says, there is no consul here. The consul flew to um, Miami and is not coming back until this thing clears up. And I said, okay, we'll wait here. No, you cannot wait here. And I said, yes, I can. This is my country. I'm staying here. So my daughter and I, we camp on the hall for, I think it was three nights and four days. And we stayed there and my lawyer kept coming to and throwing food through the fence, above the fence, right? And that's what we were eating. And we stayed there for, uh, for, that, for four days. And one day all of a sudden, an helicopter came and a few hours later, I had the passport with my daughter's name and we left the country that same day. There's so much about the story that I love, and there's so much I think speaks to who you are at levels that are are so deep and broad. Um, but I, I the, the the sheer determination that this is going to happen, and then I have so many questions for your daughter because if I'm five, and I get picked up by a stranger during a coup, and then we have to sleep in a hallway floor for three days, I'm like, who is this crazy person? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I don't think that she remembers any of that because, you know, like you, I had this sense that I felt like she already knew. I mean, like, yeah, which is so weird because they don't know anything about you. But when she saw me, Mm -hmm. she jumped on my neck, and all this time that I was there, I she would never let me go. Yeah, like I had her attached to my body, like going to the bathroom, like. She will not let me go. Yeah. And and many years later, actually, I was I moved here to the United States. And that summer we were talking, my brother came and we were talking, the three of us, about when I went to Haiti. And and I told it, and my daughter, which is her name is Illy, I said, just tell him the story. And she says, I don't know the story, mom. I don't remember. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God. I mean, like, I realized that I didn't tell the story to anybody. Nobody yeah. knew. Yeah. That's so, so amazing. And how old is she now? She's 23 right now. Wow. So for a whole whole other world that you were able to give your daughter. And it sounds like that's just what it was always meant to be anyway. <laughs> yes. She was born. I mean, like I always say, my son was born from my body. My daughter was born from my soul. And yeah. that's how it is. I mean, it's, it's just... Actually, yeah. the one that was calling now was her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she knew. She knew you were talking about her. Well, and and what I also love about that story is there's so many powerful women who the area that they struggle with is about how do I be a mom and do everything else. Mm-hmm. I have a a friend who is so amazing. I'm. I, we've been trying to get her on this podcast for years now. She's just so busy, but she chose uh, a very similar path of. I don't have a partner right now. I need to be a mom now. I'm like getting beyond a point where it makes sense to be a mom. 
and she, you know, had a child by herself. And best decision she's ever made, like it's all working out. Of course, it's really hard. It's hard no matter what combination of family you have to be a parent. Um, But it's so inspiring, I think, to other women who realize time is running out biologically. Time is running out relationship-wise, but I'm not going to give up on being a mom. Um, You know, it seems like it was such an easy choice for you to choose, you know, that's it. I'm 100% mom no matter what. Yes. I mean, I, I, to me, it's, it's always the power of choice, right? Like when you make a decision and, and you wrap your mind about yeah. whatever it is, about the idea, and you fall in love with the idea, you just have to go for it. I mean, like there yeah. is nothing else. I mean, like, especially for women, we are mm-hmm. so strong-willed and so powerful. I mean, like what women achieve in life is unbelievable. So it's, it's like anything and everything is possible for you. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And of course, no wonder that you've gone through all of this in just one part of your life we talked about. I can't imagine the rest of your life, what you've achieved if you've made Haiti and your daughter happen. But so of course that when your, your brain, the doctor says your brain is broken, you're like, no problem. I fix it. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So, you know, I've had some other amazing women on, on this uh, podcast who are, are neuroscientists or who are really committed to brain health. I'm going to absolutely connect you all after this, but, oh yeah, you know, the, we miss how important the basics are. Mm -hmm. And I love that for your business in particular, you're doing this really interesting combination of the uh, nutrition element, of course, the sleep part, but you're also really bringing in the how we approach life com- like mm-hmm. side of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what is it about that unique combination that felt like the right place for you to take all of this knowledge and what you had learned and discovered for yourself? I mean, to me, is is I mean, like we are a whole, right? Like when thing mm-hmm. when one thing is not working, the rest are you know like a stumbling. Yeah. Right. So the, the basic and, and the interesting thing is that your our body is designed exclusively to perform with food, nothing mm-hmm. else. So yeah. anything that we add from the outside that is not food, your body doesn't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. And what it does is basically creates interferences with your natural chemistry. And that will create things not mm-hmm. to work efficiently. Right. Yeah. So to me, that's very important. And, and then the other thing is, is your mind. Your mind is the biggest part of yourself. If you mm-hmm. cannot manage your thinking, right? Like um, when we make a decision, what we were saying about women, right? Like when mm-hmm. you make a decision, a choice, and you say, I'm going for it. Yeah. Food choices are the same, right? Like we choose to say, I'm going to unwind with liquor at night. Yep. Oh no, I'm going to sit 10 minutes. I'm going to do a little bit of meditation or I'm going to journal a little bit, write a few things down. So everything mm-hmm. that is bothering you in your mind is somewhere else, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it, even when you don't make a choice, you are making a choice. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just all about the thinking. So we, when you can combine those two things, there is no way you can, you can get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when you, I think it's a unique way to look at it, like things that are not food. So what are things that are not food that people are putting into their body every day and aren't thinking about? So anything that is being, um, I mean, of course, processed, right? Mm-hmm. Like any processed food, um, anything that is being uh, processed in a much deeper level. Like, for example, if we talk about uh, sugars, right? Mm-hmm. Like sugar, if we buy sugar, or something sweet, and that sweet had been bleach, yeah. right? Like they bleach sugar with ammonia. The, mm-hmm. the products that we use to clean the bathroom, they are being used to clean yeah. sugar. Or white rice is being bleached the same way, right? So all these things that uh, are at from the outside, it creates interferences. Of mm-hmm. course, processed food. Anything that you read in a label in your food, and it has numbers or letters, or you cannot picture in nature, is a chemical. That Mm -hmm. is not food. If you Mm -hmm. don't know what it is, don't eat it because it's not food, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. That's that's how simple it is. Yeah. Like usually the healthy food doesn't have a label. Yeah. Right? Anything that has a label label. is is being processed. 
-hmm. And if that label has things that you cannot read or you cannot picture in nature are not good. Yeah. And then also there is the, the part that um, <clears throat> when we are eating other species that have their own chemistry, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about growth hormone, I'm not talking about antibiotics or medication that they feed animals with, but uh, every animal has its own hormonal system just like we do. Right, mm -hmm. like they have a stress hormones, sex hormones, dopamine, yeah. serotonin, oxytocin, yeah. all these things that we have. So when we are consuming those animals, we are consuming their hormones, their chemistry, and and that causes a phenomenon called transspecies contamination. It has the power to modify our own DNA. So in the worst case scenario, being things like mad cow, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, that will be the worst case scenario. Yeah. But yes, I mean, like, if, if you think about uh, people that, I mean, like, imagine or think about men that you know that eat cow all the time, and we call them is beefy. Beefy mm -hmm. means, you know, like that shape that it looks yeah. kind of cowish, right? <laughs> or a lot of hair, or, you know, mm -hmm. is because the, the chemistry in the body is being altered by an mm -hmm. other hormones. So then, do you subscribe to a like a clean uh, plant-based diet yourself? Is that what you're working with most people on? Mm, not specifically. You yeah. know, like I, I respect uh, if you are an animal eater, let's put it that yeah. way. I, I am not a vegan or vegetarian. Vegetarian, I was, mm -hmm. and it didn't work out all the time for me. Yeah. Um, but, of course, clean food always. Mm -hmm. And always animals that are smaller than yourself. That's interesting. And is that because the, the chemistry and hormones and everything else are smaller? Totally. Levels? They have less okay. hormones and mm -hmm. your hormones are bigger. They are going to take over those little hormones or those little hormonal systems, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, you have to be the powerful here. Yeah. Really interesting. I've never heard that before. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Very cool. Um well, you know, I mentioned before, like how, how, what we both do crosses over, it crosses over into that mindset piece, right? Cause mm -hmm. I'm helping people create businesses and create strategies. Like I'm a strategy and structure to usually make a business, sometimes make a life path. Um, but that mindset piece is so critical and I am shocked just like I am shocked that we don't have, um, more mental health awareness in school. We don't have financial literacy in school, at least in the U.S. I'm also shocked that we are not teaching people these core things that anyone can do <laughs> to make life easier, more fun, you name it. Like there's th these skills that just change things in such a way that allow you to get out of the cycle of stress and struggle and pain ultimately. You know, it's like, I, I'm sure for you, it's also equally frustrating. So, you know, when you're working on the on the mind part, right? The how to use your brain and the mindset you mentioned, journaling, meditating. Um, what are some of the things you have people start with at the beginning? Because sometimes, depending on who they are and where they've come from, the it can be brand new, like a whole foreign language to somebody. Totally. Uh, to me, the easiest part to start with um, a new client or a new student the easiest is to, cont to control your body, right? Mm -hmm. Like the mind is more difficult to control. We have been practicing all for many, many years to mess it up yeah. right? <laughs> yes. as much as we can. And, and to me, being in control of what you put in your mouth mm -hmm. is much easier. And that allows to clear up the people, people's brains and people's mm -hmm. minds. And then being you know, like educate them to let go that fake control that we all have at one point, right? Like trying to control the outside world mm -hmm. when there is no way you can do that, right? And learn to control what's happening inside. And what's happening is I'm choosing what I'm eating, at what time I'm going to bed, I'm choosing with the people that I am hanging out the most of the time, the conversations I have, what kind of thoughts I have, right? And I create my goals and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, like, and my purpose, and I'm going in a direction and, and all the decisions that I make every day go in that direction. And that yeah. helps to create that more holistic approach. Yeah. Well, what are some of your favorite success stories from the people that you've worked with? 
I mean, there are so many, it, you know, like it's, it's just so um, gratifying and, and it's so humbling to see how hard people work, right? Because they are changing, um, they are changing a lifetime of unhealthy habits, right? Yeah. Like I remember one of my uh, students because she took the certification. I mean, she came to me, she had type 2 diabetes and, you know, like she was an insulin and she took it so seriously. She was not going to do the drugs. She didn't want to do the, mm -hmm. the insulin. And in three months, she had no diabetes anymore. Even the doctor said, you are clear. There is no reason for you to, to do this. And she never had any more, mm -hmm. right? So that would be one. And uh, I mean, I don't know, like those guys in the special operations is like, they amaze me all the time, right? Like mm -hmm. they come to me with a way of seeing life and, and it shifts so much because when I get them, usually is when they, I help them to transition yeah, right? from uh, active duty to civilian life and and I have one that is about to retire in two months and it's just it's just I, I feel so proud and so happy that they you know like they get to change the way that they see things right like mm -hmm. the possibilities that open up because what happens with them is after the military they've been doing for 25 30 years the same thing mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there is nothing else they know how to do besides yeah. going to war, right? And being told all the time what to do. Mm -hmm. And now you have to make decisions. You have to create a new purpose. And it, sometimes it's, it's, it's sad because, you know, like, unfortunately, they are not given all the tools that they need to transition. Yeah. And, and they have a lot of issues, right? Like PTSD, TBIs, like the most of them, the most of them have TB, uh, TBI and, and PTSD. TBI is a traumatic brain injury, right? Mm -hmm. And the first, the first one that I got, I asked him, I said, how many TBIs do you have? Because he said TBIs. And usually, you know, like people has one. Yeah. <laughs> but he said TBIs and PTSD. And I said, how many? And he says, I don't know. <laughs> like, like probably constantly, right? Like who knows, right? So it's... it's is something that in the long run is going to cause a lot of problems. And yeah. when you give the person the tools to escape all these problems, like their life changes completely, you know? Yeah. And, you know, where my head's going, you must have been jumping up and down for the past year, seeing all the different, um, you know, political marches, Black Lives Matter, the protests, the you know, conversations about what we should do with the police going forward. And, and like, you must be jumping up and down, like, call me, like, please. <laughs> yes. Like, uh, I mean, during this year, actually, I became a federal contractor. So that mm -hmm. will open up things. It's just, you know, like sometimes it's, it's frustrating and a long mm -hmm. process for them to come up to a conclusion to say, okay, yes, I guess that works. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's, 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 um, yes, because the program is really unique mm -hmm. and, and helps in so many ways. I mean, it's not only to heal their brains and give them, you know, like another life, uh, it's also help them to find a purpose. Yes. Right. Help them to be at service in another way, instead mm -hmm. of saying, no, from now on, I don't know, you are on your own. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, and that also speaks to the the whole conversation of using the term essential worker, mm -hmm. right? Because it meant that everybody else was not essential. And uh, it's to me, I'm glad that it's opened up this conversation of how we value different roles and how people contribute to society in different ways. Um, but there's a whole I hope this shift continues in the U.S. of what does it mean to work? What does it mean to have work-life balance? Because, you know, I, I was talking to a, a friend earlier from when I lived in Europe who's Italian. And she's like, yeah, I want everybody to come back to work because I love being at work with people. And I was like, yeah, I think in Europe it'll be a lot 
possible to do it faster versus the US where everyone doesn't want to commute. They they don't have the flexibility. Like there's so many, we make things so hard sometimes for absolutely no reason. And and speaking to the the federal contracts, right? It's it's so silly that the easiest things we can do, the preventative things, nobody wants to try because it's not, I don't know, it doesn't have the stamp of whatever they think that it should have. So I'm glad that they did are working with you and that that's going to keep growing because, you know, we, we get so confused about the only solutions are complicated. Well, when you talk, I mean, like the interesting part is I talked to the guys that uh, want to do the program within the military. All of them are super excited because, you know, like, oh my gosh, this is going to be really new. It's different. We mm-hmm. have to do something different. I mean, you have to think that there is still today there is 22 um, veterans or military, active duty military that they kill themselves daily, right? Crazy. Mm-hmm. Many of them, many of them are special operations guys. We don't know because, you know, like we put them in the same basket, but mm-hmm. these guys are very few in the country right? And they are the ones that are doing the most difficult jobs of yeah. all, right? Those are the guys that got Bin Laden. Those are the guys mm-hmm. that got Saddam Hussein, you know? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, and these guys need extra care because they've done everything for us, right? Yeah. So to me, it's very important. And you mentioned Black Lives Matter, and that's very dear to me. I mean, I have, of course, my daughter and very, mm-hmm. very loved ones that are a black people and to me um is one of the reasons that i keep posting on my newsletter every week about mm-hmm. them because uh, we cannot forget that mm-hmm. is there is a difference and we have to keep working really hard yeah yeah it, it's i there's so much opportunity to lead with more compassion and if just to acknowledge that if anyone or any group are in pain, like, let's go solve it. To your point, like, let's stop working on the symptoms. Like, let's really get to the root of what it is. And, you know, somebody once said to me, like, you know, the common thing of like, shouldn't all lives matter? And you're like, hold on. If you had five kids and one was struggling in school, you would give that kid extra tutoring. Like, no, this like, if if someone's suffering, we have to go help who's suffering. And who is suffering in this country and honestly in the world is, of course, bigger than than race, bigger than ethnicity. There's people suffering for, for gender, for trauma, for mental health. There's so many things. So what would it look like if we just said, yes, like, we'll help you to whomever showing up? And that's what makes me really happy that people are doing the work that you're doing because you're literally on the ground helping people be able to help themselves. And I hope with this podcast, like more people know that you're there as a resource because, you know, there's there's very few programs in the world that are that are mm-hmm. truly helping people live optimally as humans. And like I said before, like, how do we make them required? <laughs> like, how do yeah. we get everybody to do one? Because... Um, there's so many habits we have, even as a culture that are just unhealthy habits, even if they make us feel good short term. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, like from, from, I mean, one thing, uh, just as an example, right? Like going to a restaurant, the plate that you are served here or the place that you are served in Europe Mm -hmm. are completely different. There is so much food in one plate here that the whole family can eat out of this, right? <laughs> so that that c- causes a problem, right? Yeah. Another problem uh, is quick satisfaction. Is I am stressed. I'm going to drink. That's why there is so many mm-hmm. addic- so much addiction here, right? I have. I am in pain. I'm going to take a pill, mm-hmm. right? I have. I am sad because something is hap- Something happened. I'm going to take antidepressants. Or I'm going to take anti-anxiety pills. You know, like all those things don't heal anything. All those things only masks the symptoms and the underlying is going to keep brewing and brewing until the day that your mm-hmm. brain will break. Yeah. That's what yep. happened to me, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you look back on your life, would eight-year-old you have imagined that this is your life today? Oh my gosh, no. I mean, I always being a really weird person. I mean, like, 
<laughs> weird. Yes. What does I, weird mean to you? I always say I'm an alien because it feels so different than the majority of people, right? Like so out there. But I, when I was a kid, I already was. I mean, like you probably feel the same, right? Like yeah. we, I mean, like we are weird people. We do different things, right? Like know mm-hmm. what is more risky, is more, um, you know, like you have to put more grain on the grill than anybody else. And, and that's what we do. And that's what keeps us alive. But yes, when I was a kid, I was very sheltered, but I was different. I mean, like I didn't do what, I mean, like at that point in Spain, if I think about the kids that we were in my class as Mm -hmm. a grammar school class, I mean, I, I mean, I remember one guy, which was my neighbor. And myself, we were weird people. I mean, like we were like totally, you know, like doing weird things. And at the end of the day, um, the two of us are the only two that had major, I mean, like graduate education, right? Like the rest of them, I mean, a couple of them have uh, have an undergrad career, but many of them, they don't. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you say you were being weird, is that because you were like curious and you wanted to learn things or you were ex- like experimenting? Like what, what do you call weird? Cause like when I talk about me, I'm like, I, I say I was such a nerd, right? Like I loved reading and I wanted to learn and I'm like, Ooh, what's that? Like I wanted to be doing things. And yes. So study mm-hmm. is, is something that they do every single day, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I, my latest book, I have it right on my couch and is about, um, neurology and neurosurgery i'm not gonna i'm not gonna operate anybody right (laughs) but just just to keep growing Mm -hmm. skills and knowing how uh traditional medicine is is approaching uh brain right brain health uh to me when i was kid it was more the emotional stuff that was very different than my friends right like Mm -hmm. to me it was very important to be responsible like my parents trust me no matter what like mm-hmm. my dad, my entire life said, if somebody can pull this one out, it's you. You are the yeah. smartest person I know. You are the best person I know. Like smart was praised in my family. Mm-hmm. I never knew if I was cute, if I was well-dressed, yeah. if I was pretty, if I had good looking or in good shape. Never. I never <laughs> knew that. It was not in the yeah. vocabulary of the family. Mm-hmm. But the smarts, like my dad, for my dad was very important to speak many languages or different languages, to have schooling. And, you know, like for many years, I mean, I studied and then I stopped and then I went back, you know, like, but I never stopped doing something related with improving and, and growing, you know, my mind and my knowledge. I can't imagine not like I, that, to me, that's just what life is, right? It's you know, like every, um, I'll have some of my clients take the strength finder test and mine every time it's like learning number one, number one. And it's a little bit dangerous, right? Everything has the, the yin and the yang. Cause I get bored. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Um, but speaking of quizzes, so I took your quiz on your website mm-hmm. and it shows up that I am a defender, mm-hmm. which probably is not surprising to you based on our conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, You know, with the quiz that you have, how does it help you guide your clients into what's next for them or what opportunities they have? So the way that, um, I mean, in this, the quiz is, it was, it's like a fun version of the brain testing, right? Like Mm -hmm. I I run a battery of brain tests to evaluate the different areas of the brain to know Mm -hmm. what area or what the thought is around what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Because the very interesting thing that happens happens for many people is what it seems that happens for me is not the reality when you take a test like this right like sometimes you won't recognize that um i feel sad most of the time right Mm -hmm. or i am i feel nervous when i have to be in public or you know like these kind of things you you don't don't think this because you do life normally as you know it, right? And when you do it in a test, it just, um, it helps me to to see mm-hmm. the underlying, what the problem can be, right? Yeah. And especially with the operation, the special operations guys is more to identify possible 
you know, like depression or people that can have suicidal thoughts and, mm -hmm. you know, play with the idea of that to, you know, make sure that they are safe. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> I, um, I don't know if you follow Dr. Rhonda Patrick at all out of um, mm -hmm. San Diego. So she just did something on Instagram about the studies coming out about the neurological effects of COVID, mm -hmm. which I think is the scariest part of what COVID can do for people who have had it. Um, have you been looking into that or incorporating yes. any of those things? So mm -hmm. to me, to me, uh, I mean, like this is something that I've been observing, mm -hmm. but before I observed that with my clients of their children, I thought about, I mean, like when COVID was happening, I mm -hmm. thought this is going to be a big deal emotionally. Like for me, emotionally mm -hmm. is, is, is what is sticked out the most yeah. to me, children I mean, like when you are a kid and you are going to school, when you are five years old and you are going to, you know, like preschool or whatever they do, right? Um, until you are nine years old, where you are gathering and learning emotions from your peers, right? Mm -hmm. Like we as adults, we learn all kinds of emotions in different situations, right? Like how we behave emotionally in different situations. Yep. Children have been in their homes for a year and a half not having interaction with other kids so they don't they haven't been learning those emotional skills for those almost two years that they haven't been you know because when you are a kid you learn emotions how to deal with frustration on your own but you see your friends how they deal with frustration so maybe they deal differently so maybe next time i will behave different right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, or how these kids relate to their parents to their grandparents how the adults relate to you and and we have been missing all of that and mm -hmm. to me there will be a, a bracket of um emotions that haven't been expressed or learned yeah and and that creates adults less healthy emotionally yeah different emotional IQs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, cause there's, it's all big T little T trauma that's happening. And of course there's a huge spike in people reaching out for mental health support, which is great, right? Like every, we need 360 health includes our brain, as you said earlier. Yeah. Um, but I am curious to see how, how we have to adapt to, to what's going on. Cause Unlike other global level crises that that humanity has experienced, um, we now know that we need that offboarding that you're doing with the special forces. So, you know, imagine if after Vietnam we knew how to offboard people back into society, or just even the whole culture going through that together, because it's scary and. We can't just be like, oh, look, everything's fine again. Go have fun. Like, we, we, we can't make that jump that neatly, even if we would like to. Yes. Uh, I mean, and if you think about, like, the example that you just gave, right? Like, the veterans from Vietnam. I mean, there is, we are still experiencing trauma with these people, right? Like, how, man, how many homeless are out there? Yeah. Right? Like, how many elder homeless are out there? And, and mental health issues that they have been having for... Um, the agent orange and things like this, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we have to be more as a society, more proactive in the areas that especially mental health and behavioral health, right? Like you mm -hmm. cannot pretend to, you cannot pretend to have um, a veteran or a military guy fed with, you have somebody that you have been feeding pills to overpower symptoms. And all of a sudden, they are out of the military. Nobody's following up with them. They have to go to the doctor on their own. Maybe they don't go. Maybe they forget to uh, make an appointment. And, and then they run out of pills. And guess what? I'm not going to get the pills. And, and that's it. They are in trouble. Yeah. And then there is no way back for them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, and, and some cases are very alarming. Like, like, some some people, I mean, like I you know some cases that have been fed with major uh, painkillers and and with no control, right? Like prescription after prescription after prescription, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we gave you so many prescriptions, we cut you off. So all of a sudden, this person that is being with 
really a strong, very addictive medication has nothing. Yeah. What do you think is going to do? Yeah. They will go around the corner and get the first illegal drug or street drug that they will find. So it's, it's it doesn't make any sense to me. No, it, it's it's um you know the homeless crisis and is really is a important topic for me and I didn't realize until reading a study recently about 40% of the US homeless are in the US and of the people who are homeless 80 to plus percent are not people who have been chronic homeless they're not people who have a um a mental illness right they they're regular people who just can't afford to live here um, well- I go, I go to the gym every day, and then when I walk down the gym, there is a guy in the car that he owns like a SUV kind of, um, yes, a big SUV, yeah. and he sleeps there. He lives there. So he has owns a car, and the car works because once in a while he's not there, so he mm-hmm. uses the car for work, I guess, mm-hmm. and, and sleeps there. Yeah. So it happens all over the place. Yeah. And and you brought up, and what you said about transitioning the people from the military into civilian life, the same thing was shared about how Austin's handling the homeless because the people who do need help, whether it's uh, with paperwork or falling with illness or taking prescriptions, they need to know where they are. So they, so putting, putting people into homes where they have an address and they can call them or check on them actually really helps in transitioning them through because they have some, they have a place to check on them. And they have a place to give them community and support. So, you know, so much of it I, does come back to that element, right? Of do we have community and do we care about it in our culture? Because we can't just care about the people who have a house next to us. We have to care about everybody who's there. Totally. Um, and for, mm-hmm. for many of us that we have not had that experience, we don't know how it looks like. Mm-hmm. Like we don't know. And in many cases, they don't even know how to express because they don't know that's a thing. This is how they have been living their life. Like, for example, if you are 20 years, 25 years in the military and you have been told every day what to do hour by hour, and all of a sudden you have to make decisions for yourself, not for your team, for yourself, that's a big deal for them. They don't even know, you know, like they don't even talk about I. They mm-hmm. always talk about we, right? Like, and all of a sudden you are left alone in another place outside your base and everything you knew yep. with nobody else that can relate with you and now figure it out. And guess what? They give them this huge book about the, be- the veterans benefits they have that nobody reads, so they mm-hmm. won't use it, Yeah, right? Like it's, it's just... No, because it you're, doesn't make sense. No, you're losing your structure, your purpose, your community, your routine, like your house often. Like you're basically being dropped off on a foreign planet and being like, bye, figure it out. <laughs> well, and, and the problem they have, I mean, one of the things that we didn't even talk about is divorce. I mean, mm-hmm. like while they are in active duty because they are not in home the most of the time and when they are at home, you know, like they will have struggles, but the struggles goes away when the guy leaves. Mm-hmm. Or the woman lives. Um, when they are at home because they retire, I mean, like, I don't know. I think there is 90% of them, they get divorced. I mean, like, they cannot stick with their partners because mm-hmm. it's too much. I mean, like, yeah. for them and for the person they have on the side, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's, it's, it's too much. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's so many things. <laughs> there's So I'm glad that you're helping them. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, when this is called the Powerful Ladies Podcast, right? And we're talking about a lot of people who have, who are powerful people, all the more reason that people who we train to be powerful should know how to help themselves powerfully. But when you think about the words powerful and ladies separately, what do they mean to you? And does that change when those words are combined? Uh, to me, powerful is always choice, right? Like it's no that you can choose whatever you want for yourself and your life. To me, power, it means that, right? And with ladies, I mean, like, it's it's the same, right? Like, I mean, we are powerful just because women go through so much more Mm -hmm. in life, right? Like, we usually hold the house together. We raise children, we bear children, 
if we want to, right? Like that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a choice too, right? We get to do anything and everything that men do, right? Like, why do we have to get paid less? Why do we have to work harder? Why yeah. do we have, like, you know, I mean, I, I took my MBA many years ago. And in Spain at that time, uh, we were 42 in the class, 40 men, two women. Yep. One of the professors wa- was addressing women as bitches. That bitch, oh. that bitch. Yes. Right. Like that's many years. I mean, I am. I know, but still, that would never have been appropriate. <laughs> exactly. But that's 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 how it was. And, and, and it was, you know, like kind of joke. Right. Yeah. Like that's that's what it seemed at that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It wasn't malicious. It was. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was kind of funny. Mm-hmm. I mean. Seriously. <laughs> right. So yeah. and, and these things that, you know, like it's like now, now you say all lives are important. Of course, all lives are important. Mm-hmm. But your life is more is being more important for generations than somebody that is was born black in this country. So mm-hmm. let's let's make that life more important right now. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's you know, like it is is it's good that all of this. So the, the beautiful thing about United States and 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 that's why I like it, is everything is it seems like much more than anywhere else, but it's because here everything is more in the surface. Mm -hmm. right like there is many countries like when you go to germany nobody talks about hitler no you don't talk about that it's you know like it's it's like you don't joke about it you don't talk about it they are ashamed about it so we don't want to hurt them so nobody talks about it right yeah Mm -hmm. here everything is out there right like the bad the good the horror the the you know like everything so it's to me, it's good because when it's out there, you can mm-hmm. cleanse it. Yeah. If it's yeah. not out there, you don't do the cleansing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know, there's many people who uh, Barcelona would be there where they would love to move to. It's on their dream list. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you go from Spain? And were you in Barcelona or is your family there? Did you My family is still there, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I am, you know, like... I. I mean, no, since COVID, but, you know, like right. we travel back and forth constantly. Like my children yeah. are here. My daughter is in college. My son works. So he doesn't have so much flexibility, but my daughter is yeah. here with me three months during the summer. And then I Christmas, I go there for two or three weeks. And, yeah. and you know, like we kind of have flexibility traveling. We are lucky that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, about living in Barcelona, to me, it's a beautiful city. Oh yeah, well, it's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Huh? It's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, have you been there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, nice, wonderful. Um, the only thing that they have in Spain right now, and you know, like I don't like to put Catalonia with in Spain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as a true Catalonian, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but I have to say that the politics there. Uh, I mean, like all Europe, I think all the entire world mm-hmm. here it got a little bit better. But in the entire world, the politics need to be cleansed. I think we are on the bridge of um, changing the way that we know politics. Mm -hmm. It feels like this kind of politics has to change because Mm -hmm. it's clear that doesn't work. Yeah. It works for a few. It doesn't work for too many. Yeah. We, yeah. we, we, we keep getting closer to, to serving the masses or serving the common good. You know, like it keeps the, who gets, who gets help keeps getting bigger, but it hasn't gotten big enough. Yes. Um, so it just, it went from, you know, a, a royalty based organization to a rich based organization. <laughs> so we well, we just went down a tier from like the royalty to the aristocrats, but we haven't gone down that next tier to common everyday people yeah i mean imagine in europe that like spain and england we still have royalty Mm -hmm. which is 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 is, to me is is very antique it's awful right like people that gets to do to make a lot of money for no reason Mm -hmm. (laughs) generation after generation 
right? And and then uh, like in Spain, the family of the dictator, because I was born in a dictatorship, uh, this guy's family is still live without having to work. That's how much money they have, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, man, these people kill so many. I mean, how are they still not in jail? <laughs> yeah, and on yachts. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. go to work like anybody else, right? Like mm-hmm. pay your taxes like anybody else. They don't, right? Like it's, it's mm-hmm. it, all of this has to change because it's too much. I mean, like it's too much for us to support a country that is rotten underneath, you know, mm-hmm. like and, and the day by day person has to sacrifice so much for a few to be really wealthy. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of great documentaries too, if anyone wants to, anyone listening Googles it, but the the impact that uh, wealth distribution can have on a society is crazy because it doesn't take these big shifts to make it happen because the percentages equal so much amount. 1% of GDP is huge for who it can impact and change. So it's a really interesting concept, and I agree with you. There's, there's very much a old way, new way of of doing things, and especially in parts of Europe where they have more uh, th- systems in place to allow everyday people to live lives of a bit more quality, whether it's vacation time or paternity leave or just some things that should be basic, <laughs> you know, healthcare or whatever. I think it's interesting to see how things are shifting because, again, it ties back to what you do as well. You know, it's it's hard to say we value all people equally uh, when not everyone has time to be with their family or take care of the, their loved ones. Or we think vacation time is a privilege, but most of the time vacation time or, or time off is not used for holidays. It's really used so that you can do life you know, go to a kid's concert or, you know, take care of them when they're sick. Like it's, it's a different concept than I think people think when they're like, you know, just taking holidays all the time, but we need those too for our mental health. (laughs) Yes, totally. I mean, like to me, this is the part that where United States is so behind Mm -hmm. instead of Europe, right? Like we have in Europe, if you are sick, you will still get paid the same. Mm -hmm. If you break an arm, you still will get paid the same. And you have paid vacations every year, at least a month, at least a month, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's supported by law. And the company doesn't pay. The government pays because you pay taxes for that reason, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how it works. And and this is is, uh, socialism, which here is so misunderstood. Yes. Right? Like here, socialism, they think is communism. It's not the same. No. <laughs> it's no. not the same, right? And we have socialism here in some things, like public schools are yes. social security, right? Um, medical. Mm-hmm. Those things are uh, socialism, but uh, uh, still, we are so far behind, right? Yeah. I, I lived in Germany for four years, and everyone's like, we don't want to be like Germany. And I'm like, when I lived there, I had... The cheapest lifestyle I've ever had. I had the most fun, like the least amount of stress. I'm like, what was wrong with that? Like, of course, Germany has things that they need to deal with as a country and politically, but some of those essential structures, I remember we, they offered like a financial planning class for everyone at the office. And it, I'm like the only American in this group that they had put together. And this one person raises their hand and they go, okay, well, what happens when I get my inheritance? And I was like, who's getting inheritance? Like what? (laughs) And like, just the idea of like having pensions and having, having this money put aside so that when you, after working so hard for so long, you can maintain some sort of a lifestyle that you've worked hard and pay taxes on. It was just shocking to me because we don't realize these micro stresses that we put on ourselves about being independent in the U S when life could just be a little bit easier if we all um, just did things a little bit simpler again. Yeah, I mean, also Europe, we have more support. Like when I, Mm -hmm. I mean, like when I was sick, when I had my brain problem, of course I had to do it myself. 
but I had a lot of support. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like when they say it takes a village, it certainly take a village, right? Yeah. It yeah. took a village for me. Like my parents were there and my friends were there all the time. Like I, I if I had to t- to have my t- kids that they care because I couldn't do it, somebody mm-hmm. did it. Like I still remember my grandmother was alive and she would come and cook and do something, you know, like it's, yeah. it, you have lots of support because people live around you. They are mm-hmm. around you. In the United States, that's very difficult. Yeah. It might yeah. happen, but it's very rare. Yeah. And, well, that- you know, like that's a part that we are missing. We are mm-hmm. missing. Community is very important. Very, very important. Well, that's a perfect segue to my next question, which are who are the powerful ladies that have made an impact in your life? And how has having other powerful women in your life changed your path? I would say, I mean, like there is as many women as men. I I Mm -hmm. didn't, you know, like go after, uh, you know, like Mm -hmm. looking for women. My mentor is a man, Bob Proctor. And, but I have many, many women. I have good friends that are, I have uh, my best friend, Marta is one of them. She yeah. owns her own business too. And she, you know, like strong and powerful. Um, the one that caused a big impact in my life because I had, I was lucky enough to meet her was Mother Teresa. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there is so many. I have a friend called, uh, which is an, another entrepreneur, which is Hazel Ortega. I have, I mean, like so many different women and, and women that they work every day, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, like when I see my assistants, how they work and, and how they help and, you know, like whatever you need. And today it was Sunday and one of, it, one of them is on vacation and I still remember you have the podcast interview, <laughs> right? Like it's, yeah. they are there. So to me, women is just a marvelous, a marvelous being that mm-hmm. we can help each other in everything and anything. And that's very, very powerful and strong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we ask everybody on the podcast where they put themselves in the powerful lady scale, zero being average everyday human and 10 being the most powerful lady imaginable. Where do you put yourself today? And where do you think you put yourself on average? Today, I will put myself an eight. I will give a good score because I think <laughs> I think I work my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, but yes, I mean, I am I am striving for ten. That's for sure, right? I'm not there yet, but you know. And and I think you are never. I mean, it's better if you are never there because you keep mm-hmm. having a goal and yes. a place where to go, right? Like I probably in a couple of years I will still be eight. You know, it's, it's just try to do better. How can you help? Or provide more service and better service to anybody and everybody and always always support women because to me is 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 who is the future in this world because the world will be much fair and more equal and more loving and a caring place that's for yeah. sure I love that. Well, for everybody who is now a huge fan of yours after listening to this episode, um, what's next for you? How can they participate? How can they support you? What are all the things that they can do to follow along and and be part of your world? So, well, to me, one really good thing is to sign up for the newsletter because there we post everything that is important to me and the things that I believe with, right? Right. Uh, like for example, we are got, we are collecting signatures uh, to raise. A, we are collecting actually one hundred thousand signatures to raise awareness in Congress for special operations mental health um, mm-hmm. during transition, right? Mm-hmm. Because to me, it's very important. And apparently, you have to create pressure uh, for that. And less than a hundred thousand doesn't do anything. So we need a hundred thousand, and that's in our in our newsletter every week. It comes up for you to sign up. Um, <clears throat> follow Instagram and Nourish the Brain Institute, and you know, like I don't know, like email and say who you are. I love to take our quiz. It's good yeah. for you, you know, like have fun and know a little bit more how your brain uh, is built. So. Yeah. 
Perfect. And then I saw that you have the uh, training so people can get certified in your methodology. Um, yes. You also have some uh, classes or, or group things that people can join as well. So I, yes, I have created a program, which is the one that are uh, the military are being trained with mm-hmm. and it's called brain and behavior coach. And it's basically educate them how to do prevention instead of medication. Yes. yes. The other thing is I'm about to launch my book. Ooh, exciting. I have it here, right? It's called The Fabulous Brain. And this is going to be launched in the next, uh, I don't know. I'm waiting for the foreword, which is one of the special operations guys is writing the foreword. <laughs> and, but it's going to be out within the next month. Yeah. Congratulations. What a huge accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I feel very happy. You can also uh, pre-order from the website. It's already for pre-order. Perfect. Well, I'm very excited to share the petition, the book, and everything else you have going on with the Greater Powerful Aids community and our, our Thrive membership as well. Um, you know, when you think about whether it's a book you've read or a quote or just someone who inspires you every day, what's a, a little piece of knowledge that you would love to leave with everyone listening? To me, the one thing that uh, it makes more sense is what one of the sayings that Bob Proctor always says, and is if you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, to me, this is, it says everything, right? Like the power that we have in our minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it has been such a pleasure to meet you. I'm so honored that you are a yes. You are an incredible human. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And I can't wait to stay in touch and see how we can collaborate in the future. Thank you so much for having me here. And at the same time, congratulations, because you have an awesome podcast. I've been listening. And I think it's, it's really amazing that you created this podcast called Powerful Ladies, because I love working with ladies too. So thank Thank you you so much. (laughs) Thank you for listening to this episode. All the links to connect with Jemmy are in our show notes at thepowerfulladies.com forward slash podcast. There you can also leave me comments and ask questions about this episode. Want more Powerful Ladies? Come join us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. We can also find some free downloads to start being powerful today. Subscribe to this podcast and help us connect with more listeners by leaving us a five-star rating and review. If you're looking to connect directly with me, please visit caraduffy.com. I'd like to thank our producer, audio engineer, and composer, Jordan Duffy. Without her, this wouldn't be possible. You can follow her on Instagram at Jordan K. Duffy. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love.